The Purpose of a Diet Ever since certain fad diets became popular in the 70s and 80s, the general conception of a diet is viewed as a quick and easy tool to help its participants lose a few pounds without any regard to lifelong eating habits. In other words, it is seen as a short-term fix. What ends up happening with people on these short-term plans is that they tend to go back to eating poorly after the weight goal has been met or worse, when the weight goal hasn't been met and seems impossible to achieve. In fact, researchers at UCLA have recently revealed shocking findings. Dieting just doesn't work. The school reviewed 31 long-term studies on dieting and found that people who go on diets usually end up regaining all of the weight they lost, plus some after they stop dieting. In addition to the weight gain, researchers say that the ups and downs of dieting cause added stress and contribute to heart disease. The study seems bleak for those looking to shed pounds, but still, people continue the quick-fix methods, moving to the next one as soon as they give up on the previous one, usually to no avail. This yo-yo dieting confuses the body and frustrates the psyche, and never quite lives up to the sensational claims that these diet gimmicks advertise. Testimonials similar to, I lost 50 pounds in five weeks, and I dropped 15 pounds in the first week, lead to inaccurate interpretations of what a diet should be. If these people were to continue on their so-called diet, they would be weightless within a couple of years. Now that would be amazing. The truth is that these diets, which temporarily allow rapid weight loss, are oftentimes just dehydrating the body. The weight lost on these diets is primarily in H2O and not LBS, and since the body is about 60% water, it is fairly easy to drop a few pounds of it. Inevitably, though, the contestants on these miracle diets must change their habits back or at least alter them so as not to eliminate themselves from existence altogether. These wacky eating habits are missing the point completely, and they are leading to a misnomer. A diet, by definition, is not some two-week panacea to help you lose weight. It is much broader than just that. A diet is someone's general intake of food. People still have a diet even when they're not on a diet. A diet also is something that takes over one's entire life, not just the five weeks before one's wedding day or class reunion. When looked at in this light, people who go on those gimmicky diets advertised on late-night television aren't on a high-protein diet or a lettuce-only plan. These people are on an extremely unhealthy yo-yo diet. Changing one's eating habits so drastically so often is bad for one's health something that most diet promoters fail to explain. Interestingly, an obese person has a better chance of living longer than someone who fluctuates habitually between being obese and having an ideal weight. A University of Michigan study conducted by cardiologist Claire Duvernoy, MD, has found that a direct link between the gain-loss-gain syndrome of yo-yo dieting and cardiovascular disease in women. It turns out that such an oscillation of weight adds a great deal more stress than a constant weight. But natural man went through long droughts without food. Doesn't that mean that we are designed to withstand ups and downs in our diet, like our ancestors? While we do have a remarkable capability to adapt to our environment, described further in Part 2, up and down dieting is still considerably harmful. In addition, during a drought, natural man's body mass index, BMI, shifted from ideal to underweight and back, a completely different physiological story than a BMI that shifts from obese to overweight and back. That isn't to say that one shouldn't try to lose weight if they're a little tight in the waistline. The constantly obese person has a drastically smaller chance of living longer than someone at a constant ideal weight. A Dutch study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, 2003, says that obese women live an average of 7.1 fewer years than women of normal weight. Obese men live 5.8 fewer years on average than their healthy counterparts. That's almost 10% of the average lifespan. The solution for everyone is to learn a method of eating that brings everyone to his or her ideal weight and keeps them there 
without the need to yo-yo diet. The typical counter to that statement would be, well, everyone is different. There can't possibly be a diet that works for everyone. But there is. It just so happens that at one point, all humans did eat the same diet, the natural hunter-gatherer diet, and they were remarkably healthier than we are today, despite lack of medicine and wealth, as we'll see later. Zero to Paleo emulates this healthy hunter-gatherer diet and supports a robust lifestyle for everyone, regardless of personality or physical makeup. Because this method of eating is strictly linked to the natural methods of the body, it will work to create a stable, healthy weight for everyone who adheres to the guidelines. One of the most vital attributes of Zero to Paleo is that it is even beneficial for people who are already at their ideal weights. Thus, someone can maintain just one diet for their entire life, the healthy way it should be. What about the fat gene? Some people would argue that some people were born with a fat gene, and it is nearly impossible for those people to maintain a healthy weight without surgery or medical assistance in the form of prescription drugs. It is understandable if you have accepted this train of thought, since it pervades the popular media. There are people out there that want to make you think that you have no say in your physical state. Uh, but their magical pill does. The FDA does not recognize any form of natural cure, i.e. exercise or antioxidants, as a treatment for disease. Only artificial drugs can be called a treatment, and this seems a little suspect to me. It just so happens that there is very little that differs between humans, with respect to genes, even when it comes to a person's weight or retention of fat. A recent study conducted by Dr. Roy J. Britton at the California Institute of Technology, published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, has found that even humans and chimpanzees have nearly identical genetic makeup. According to the study, 95% of the genetic makeup of chimps is the same as that of humans. Shockingly, we're even quite similar to plants like a pumpkin. Similar methods of experimentation showed that pumpkins and humans share about 75% of our DNA. However, this doesn't mean we need to look like a pumpkin. Based on the study's findings, it appears that just being alive accounts for so much of our genetic code that there is very little left over to produce differences like eating tendencies or nuances in the digestive system. The CIT study has found that two different humans are 99.9% .9 genetically identical. Based on the number of genes scientists have found that humans have, about 30,000, you are only 30 or so genes different from Mick Jagger, and this applies to everyone with the normal amount of 23 paired chromosomes. That's astounding. It turns out that our previous idea of a gene for every protein created was the wrong way to think about it. It's not the number of genes that determines who we are, but what our genes do with what they are given that gives us the diversity and complexity of being human. So we can actually alter what our genes do and how they work based on what we feed them. In other words, we truly are what we eat. Likewise, the perception that genetic makeup determines who we are is also false. It is what we do with our genetic makeup that makes us who we are. This stirs up the ancient argument of nature versus nurture, which to my knowledge has not been definitively answered. No one can deny we are a product of our genes. Just think of all the times you've heard, you've got your father's eyes, or more unfortunately, you've got your father's bald patch. But even the most ardent naturalists will concede that behavior plays a significant role in one's physical construction. They would add that all people could be fit and healthy, though they would argue that some people need to try harder than others for ideal health. I contest that it's not a matter of trying harder, but rather being more thoughtful and simply living how we were designed to live. Thus, without going into the argument of nature versus nurture, we must presume that regardless of one's genetic makeup, everyone can be lean and fit. No one is precluded from attaining a healthy body and a healthy mind, with an ideal weight. This is one of the most important factors in achieving a healthy lifestyle. You must know that you can do it for it to be possible at all. 
the beneficial aspects of positive psychology are unlimited. And though the idea is important to understand, it deserves its own book, and I can't do it justice here. With that little bit of motivation, perhaps the reader can better understand the idea that we're all made with basically the same instructions. But we don't all do the same thing with those instructions. I've heard countless times people say that it is impossible to be as thin as a supermodel or some famous skinny actress. On the contrary, it is extremely likely for anyone to be that thin if they did the same things. This is based on one simple principle. If someone expends more calories than he takes in, he will lose weight. And if he takes in more calories than he burns, he will gain weight. This applies to average Joe as much as it applies to Cindy Crawford or Giselle Bunken. What my acquaintances and others mean to say when they scoff at the impossible supermodels is that it's impossible to be as thin as those models while eating what I eat and exercising as little as I do. When it's phrased that way, it seems kind of obvious, doesn't it? It is important to note that the idea here is not to be bone thin. In fact, Super thin supermodels are probably not as healthy as they could be because some fat is necessary for a completely healthy body to operate. We will discuss this in part four. The important thing is to be healthy, which certainly includes not being overweight, but also includes not being underweight. There are equally detrimental problems associated with being underweight as there are with being overweight, although in today's American society, the former is not as prevalent of a problem. It is also common to maintain a constant body weight while exercising and eating proportionately, yet to still have an unhealthy body weight. There is a middle ground in weight at which the human body is perfectly content. It is a natural state of being, in which the calories ingested are equivalent to the calories expended, and in which there is no excess storage of calories to maintain. This is the state that we should want to achieve, a state that is free from culturally influenced abnormalities, such as three square meals per day, the gigantic-sized portions of takeout culture, Atkins, the cabbage diet, and fast food. The healthy, natural state is a condition of existence which your body has been begging you to achieve for all of your life. Your body has told you when you are not treating it right with uncomfortable feelings like guilt, perhaps some health conditions, and even pain. It is time that you rid yourself of all of that negativity issued by an unhealthy diet and to move to a clean and healthy method of eating. It's time to get to the state of perfect balance within yourself, to start listening to your body, and become the healthy individual you know you can be. It is time to go from zero to paleo.